My name's Bob. I have not actually stood behind this pulpit in about 11 weeks. Um, and that's actually by design. Um, we're a church that's committed to equipping and developing leaders, and that includes equipping and developing people in preaching and teaching God's Word. And so whether people are brand new on our team or have been here for a long time, we just always love um, continuing to do that work over the summers. And that's sort of one of the times when we just try to bring a lot of different voices in the pulpit. And so back in February, uh, we started gathering in the conference room with a whiteboard and just mapping out psalms and studying and thinking about sermon outlines and um, it's been fun to just sit out among you and hear the word preached to me. And uh, I think you probably feel, as I do, that we have a really stellar team of leaders here. And so thanks to Mike and Kevin and Dusty and Justin and all the others who have preached this summer. So it's been really fun uh, to be here among you. But I actually get to uh, preach today. So I guess that could be good or bad for you, depending on uh, how rusty I am. Uh, what I've been doing over the past few months um, is, well, a few things in May. Uh, celebrating two graduations. So my older son, Parker, uh, graduated with a master's degree, and then my younger son, Lewis, graduated from high school. And so that was all on the same weekend. So I didn't preach that weekend. It was a little busy. Uh, we had a lot going on. Uh, then Lee and I celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary also in May. So yeah, thank you. Um, so we took a little trip to celebrate that. Um, in June and July, kind of been investing in some different pastors and church planters. And so just a couple weeks ago, we had half a dozen uh, church planters here for about three days doing some training and equipping and just spending time here so we could invest in what God is doing in their churches. And in fact, even next weekend, I will be in Denver, Colorado, celebrating the launch of a brand new church plant out of Fellowship Denver um, in the northern part of Denver. And so just sort of celebrating and encouraging the work of church planting throughout our region. Um, so that's cool. I've also been doing, or well, not doing, but working on the final touches for some writing projects. Um, this thing is coming out in three weeks. Um, this is a little Bible study on First Peter. So it's just based on a sermon series that we preached here about five years ago. So if, you, if your mom ever calls you and she's like, hey, I'm leading a Bible study at church. Do you know any good material? Now you have an answer. Here's a book on First Peter that just got put out. And so that's coming out in a few weeks. And I've actually been working on that for a long time, but the past few weeks just doing some final stuff to help get ready for um, that thing to launch. So um, that's kind of what I've been up to over the past weeks and months. And it's good to be with you this morning and get to preach a sermon in our series on the Psalms. And um, this Psalm, Psalm 40, is one you might be familiar with, even if you've never read the Bible. The reason is because back in November of 1982, in a recording studio in Dublin, Ireland, there was a little up-and-coming rock band named U2 that was working on their third album, and after an exhausting all-night recording session, they were still one song short. And so they were kind of wiped out and just trying to find inspiration, and in kind of a burst of creativity, they decided to revive an old bass riff that they had used, but that had never really shaped itself into a coherent song. And so The Edge started playing that little bass riff, and Bono, in search of a lyric, opened his Bible to Psalm 40 and started singing some words. The resulting song, you know simply by the title 40. And if you've ever been to a live U2 show, um, chances are the, the concert ended with the band members walking off the stage one by one while the audience sings that refrain. How long to sing this song? They've ended dozens of live shows that way. And so perhaps it's playing that car in the cassette deck or that tape in the cassette deck of my car when I was in high school that made me want to preach this sermon. I don't know, but I, I have an affinity for Psalm 40 and that may be part of why. And so we come this morning in our little journey through the Psalms to this psalm that, again, even if you don't know the Bible, if you listen to the radio, sometimes songs uh, will come on that remind you of these psalms, and that's certainly the case with that song. And as we come to this text this morning, I want to ask you a question that maybe you haven't thought about, but that I think you should be thinking about. A question that I think as we read the psalms should be top of mind if we're going to be serious readers of the Bible and that question is simply this. What right do you have to read the Psalms? Have you ever thought about that question? 
After all, this is the songbook of the Jewish people. They have been singing these songs for centuries. In fact, they were singing them centuries before a man named Jesus of Nazareth ever lived or died. So what right do you have as a Christian to take the Jewish scriptures and claim that they belong to you in some way? What right do you and I have even to read the Psalms and treat them as part of our story? That's what I want to try to answer this morning. That may be an abstract and weird question, but those are the kinds of questions I have when I read the Psalms. So whether you have it or not, we're answering it this morning, all right? And I want to show you how Psalm 40 helps us to answer that question. In fact, I want to unpack Psalm 40 by thinking about the four singers of this song. So if you have a Bible, please open it to Psalm 40. It's on page 438 of the Black Bible that you will find under your seat. I want to think about the four singers of this song. Singer number one, the first singer we need to pay attention to, is the original psalmist, the original writer of this song. The ascription tells us this is a psalm of David. Uh, This psalm was first written then by an individual who experienced in a meaningful way God's deliverance in his own life. Look how the psalm begins. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. So you hear the personal pronouns. This is written out of an experience of deliverance where an individual human being cried out to God and God answered and brought deliverance. You notice the metaphors in verses one through three are metaphors of sinking down in the bog and of God setting my feet on a rock and making my steps secure and therefore of God giving me a new song to sing, a song of praise. This is an account of personal deliverance. And then in verses 4 and 5, this individual psalmist also locates his story within the broader story of people who have had similar experiences. He says, Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and thoughts toward us. He's saying, hey, this isn't just my experience. There's a people, there's an us who have these kinds of experiences of God delivering them. Verses six through eight, we'll come back to in just a minute. Verses nine and 10, the psalmist goes on to say, I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. So this individual person, having experienced God's deliverance, realizes, hey, The natural thing to do is to share about this, to talk about this, to sing about this, to speak of this to others. This God who has come through to deliver me should be spoken of in the great congregation. And in a sense, that's what we gather here every week to do, right? I mean, if you've been around here for at least a few weeks, every Sunday morning looks pretty much the same here, doesn't it? We come together, we sing some songs, we hear the scriptures read, we pray, we hear a sermon preached, we come to the Lord's table. It looks kind of the same every single week. If you were like looking for novelty, this is not the thing you would do every week, right? The reason we do this is because we relate to what the psalmist is saying. There's something about experiencing God's deliverance that makes it appropriate for us to speak of that and sing of that together. And then the psalm closes in verse 11 through 17 with a cry for deliverance in the current moment. Verse 12, evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. And then the closing line of the psalm, you are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O my God. So the psalmist is looking back and saying, I cried out and the Lord heard me and delivered me. And then he's saying, God, do that again in the current moment. Because as most of us who have lived very long have figured out, I don't need deliverance just once, right? There are many times throughout life where I need a deliverer, where I need a helper, where I'm crying out and hoping someone will hear and respond meaningfully to my need. So the first singer of this psalm was the individual psalmist, the writer. And so when we, as individual human beings, hear this psalm, we hear it first as individuals. This song is for you, 
to sing. This song is for me to sing. We can resonate with the I language here. In fact, the basic testimony of a Christian is simply this. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog. That just assumes that you have found yourself sinking in the bog and have cried out to God for deliverance and have experienced him setting your feet in a firm place. This also acknowledges that if you've never found yourself in such a place, chances are you haven't cried out to God for deliverance and that maybe this psalm feels a little foreign to you. The only people who experience God's help and deliverance are those who realize that they're sinking, right? I was talking with a friend recently and she had this great phrase uh, to describe sort of the stories that many of us live in. And the phrase was the island where it all works out. Right? We're all living for the island where it all works out, aren't we? We have a vision of how life is supposed to go. And if we could just get to that job or that career or that relationship or get our life to that place or move into that house or get to that new stage of life, if we got to the island where it all works out, then everything would be great, right? Except then you get there and you realize it's actually a miry bog, right? And you're like sinking down. You realize that like, I got to the island where it all works out, but it didn't all work out. And when that happens, then you can have this same experience as Psalmist did, where you realize, I feel like I don't have any footing, anything to stand on. Like life is just sort of slipping away around me. I feel like I'm sort of sinking in this quicksand. Those who know that kind of moment, that kind of experience, those who have called out to God in that kind of a place in life can resonate with what the psalmist is saying. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me. And heard my cry. So the first singer of this psalm is the individual psalmist, the person who first wrote it, or the f- person who first wrote it, um, David. However, there's also a second singer of the psalm, isn't there? Because this isn't just one person's poem sitting in a journal somewhere. This is in the psalms of the Jewish people. It's in the Psalter, the hymn book of Israel. It's intended for God's people to sing together. So you can imagine all of God's people gathered in the temple singing this psalm together and finding solidarity in their shared experience, right? Together, they are a people who waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to them and heard their cry. When you think of all of God's people in the Old Testament singing this song together, now you can See why verses like verse 5 have greater resonance. You have multiplied, O Lord, your wondrous deeds and thoughts toward us. Or verse 16, may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. This isn't just a song of an individual. It's the song of a people who have experienced God's deliverance. Again, similar to many of the songs we sing here as we gather on a Sunday. We sing songs that have I pronouns in them and they're the expression of individual deliverance. And yet we sing them together in a room with hundreds of other people who are saying, yes, this is our story. This is our shared experience. When we think of God's people in the Old Testament singing this song together, verse 6 stands out as a little bit odd. Look at it with me. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. That should strike you as odd. Because if you've read much of the Bible, you know that burnt offering and sin offering God had in fact required. This is very much part of the Old Testament story. Numbers 28 verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, command the people of Israel, my offering you shall be careful to offer to me at its appointed time. Deuteronomy 12 verse 11, to the place that the Lord your God will choose, you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes. So if God did command Israel to make sacrifices... Why does the psalm say burnt offering and sin offering you have not required? Here's why. Because sacrifices and offerings were never the point. And all of God's people knew that. 
As the prophet Samuel says in 1 Samuel 15, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. All of God's people understood that yes, offerings and sacrifices were part of the religious ritual that God had commanded, but they were merely a picture, a symbol of the deeper sacrifice that God really delights in. What God wants is for his people to be fully given over to him. If you read about the burnt offering in the Mosaic books of the Old Testament, it's often called the whole burnt offering. The idea is this whole animal is getting sacrificed up to the Lord. And the reason it matters that it's the whole animal is because that's a symbol of what God wants from his people. He wants all of you, your whole life, all of you offered up to him in obedience and service and worship. That's what God wants. He wants people who delight to do his will and who his law is in their heart. That's what God has always wanted from his people. Now listen, that's still true today. That's what God wants from you, right? God's not impressed that you and I are here showing up to church and doing the religious thing. What God wants is people who actually delight to do his will. who want to be fully given over to him. And throughout the Old Testament, the prophets continually rebuke God's people for showing up and making their offerings and sacrifices without actual obedience. I mean, this is a consistent problem if you've read your Bible. And the prophets continually rebuke the people of God and say, hey, don't, don't bring your offerings and sacrifices without a desire to actually follow God and do what God wants. Listen to a few of these texts from the prophets. Isaiah chapter 1, uh, chapter 12 is on the slide there, but that's the wrong reference. It's Isaiah 1, 12 through 14. The prophet Isaiah says this, when you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. What God is saying is don't bring me your offerings while you're walking in evil and injustice. The prophet Amos writes this, even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Finally, the prophet Jeremiah, God says this, In the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt... I did not speak to your fathers or command them concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices, but this command I gave them, obey my voice and I will be your God and you shall be my people and walk in all the way that I command you that it may be well with you. But they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked in their own counsels and in the stubbornness of their evil hearts and went backward and not forward. From the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt to this day, I have persistently sent all my servants, the prophets, to them day after day. Yet they did not not listen to me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck. You can see the repeated prophetic theme, can't you? Does God delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? No. No. He delights in people who delight to do his will, who want to walk in his ways and give themselves fully to him and live for his purposes in the world. So when God's people sang Psalm 40 together, it was both a reminder of what God wanted and a rebuke. I mean, can you imagine singing, I delight to do your will, O God, and your law is within my heart. What Israelite could sing that and mean it. Well, that brings us 
to the third singer of this song, the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to remind you that Jesus of Nazareth was born into a Jewish family. He grew up attending the synagogue, traveling with his family to the temple each year for the feasts, singing the psalms together with his people. The Lord Jesus Christ would have sung Psalm 40 as a young Israelite man before he ever preached a sermon or performed a miracle or called any of his disciples. And that's the key to understanding who Jesus is. Some of us think the story of Jesus begins on page one of the New Testament. But listen, the story of Jesus is the story of Israel. Jesus came into the world as an Israelite to fulfill the vocation of Israel. If you want to think about it this way, Jesus is an Israel of one. Where all of God's people had fallen short, where none of them could sing Psalm 40 with integrity, Jesus comes to catch up all of those broken promises and those unfulfilled longings and to fulfill them and be for Israel what Israel could not be on its own. So when we read the Psalms, this is a practice I do in the whiteboard when we're just thinking about Psalms. One of the things I always tell the team is, hey, let's hear this Psalm as though it's on the lips of Jesus. What would it be like for Jesus to sing these words? What would it be like for Jesus to sing this song? And when we think of it that way, the Psalms take on a whole new significance. Hold your spot in Psalm 40 and turn over to the book of Hebrews chapter 10, at the end of the New Testament. And I want to show you this connection that the writer of Hebrews makes. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. It can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? Okay, just pay attention. Do you notice how he's just being an intelligent reader of the Bible? He's saying, okay, in the Old Testament, you had these sacrifices. Every year, they're making the same sacrifices. If those were the point, if those could have removed sin or dealt with the problem, wouldn't they have just been done offering them? Because it would have been over and taken care of, and there would be no need to keep offering them over and over again. Verse 3, but in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Verse 5, consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. The writer of Hebrews sees Christ as the great singer of Psalm 40. In fact, he sees the psalm written by David centuries earlier as a song composed for the moment that Christ came into the world. He says, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired. It's as though David was writing the song in anticipation of this moment. But listen, it gets even more interesting. Stay with me here. We're going to go into Bible nerd land and you're going to be thankful on the other side, okay? Okay. So look again at Psalm 40, verse 6. And notice it says, In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. You have given me an open ear. In the Hebrew text, the phrase that translated, you have given me an open ear, reads literally in the Hebrew, you have bored ears for me. You have dug out ears for me. Because it envisions God as a sculptor, a potter preparing and fashioning the psalmist's body out of some kind of raw material, boring out ears so that this human being could hear the word of God. That's kind of the image that's here, okay? Hold that thought in your mind, and let's do a little history lesson. The last Old Testament prophet, Malachi, ministered around 400 BC. Around 325 BC, if you know your world history, the world changed. Do you know why? Because Alexander the Great conquered most of the known world. And Greek became suddenly the dominant language 
throughout most of the world. And so in about 200 BC, the king of Egypt brought 70 rabbis to Alexandria and directed them to translate the Hebrew Bible into Greek. The king of Egypt wanted to have the best library in the world. And all the ancient world knew that the Hebrew scriptures were one of the great literary treasures in existence. And so the king of Egypt wanted that literary treasure translated into Greek so that the average person living in the world could read it, not just those who knew Hebrew. So these 70 rabbis set to work translating the Hebrew scriptures into Greek and gave us what is known as the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. When those rabbis came to Psalm 40 and came to the phrase, you have dug out ears for me, they had one of those moments that all of us have when we're trying to like translate something into another language where we're like, mm, that's not going to make sense in the new language because that's a way that we talk that they don't talk. So they understood there's, there's both this literary image there of God digging out ears, but there's also the literary device of metonymy, which takes a part of something for the whole, like the way we talk about Washington when we're really talking about the federal government, right? So they realized when, when the psalm says, God, you have dug out ears for me, it's, it's metonymy for God preparing the body of a person, creating a person. And so they translated that phrase a body you have prepared for me. So if you were to read Psalm 40 in the Septuagint, it says, in sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but a body you have prepared for me. Okay, so go back to Hebrews 10, and notice that the writer of Hebrews quotes the Septuagint translation of Psalm 40. Why? Why does he say, a body you have prepared for me? Why quote the Septuagint? The writer of the book of Hebrews is very knowledgeable of the Old Testament and likely spoke very good Hebrew. Why here did he choose the Septuagint translation? Well, quite simply, because it more explicitly draws the connection to the incarnation of Jesus Christ. The early church understood that when God prepared a body for Jesus and sent him into the world, that was the great fulfillment of Psalm 40 and of all of God's promises to Israel. So let's go back to the question we started with. What right do you have to read the Psalms, Christian? Well, you have all the right in the world because the Psalms themselves point forward to an ideal Israelite who really would do God's will wholeheartedly. And the prophets of Israel repeatedly remind us that that person has not come yet. That ideal Israelite, that Israel of one, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And friends, the first century Christians did not see Christianity as some new religion they saw it as the continuation of Judaism. That's the reason why when they went to a new city to preach the gospel, where did they go? To the synagogue. Because that's where God's people were gathered. And they went there to preach Jesus as the true fulfillment of all Israel's longings and hopes. Here's how the biblical scholar and historian Brad East puts it. He says, in the wake of the destruction of the Jerusalem temple in A.D. 70, two distinct Judaisms emerged from the wreckage. One was Pharisaic, the other Messianic. Each was a fundamentally Jewish movement founded on interpretation of the Jewish scriptures. Each laid claim to Israel's scriptures and to continuation of the life of old Israel. The notion of a wholesale Gentile religion arbitrarily arrogating the Jewish scriptures to itself is as fanciful as it is anachronistic. The Christian church may be wrong in its interpretation of Tanakh, but it is not wrong to read them as scripture for itself. The new covenant wrought in Jesus is the climax and consummation of God's work in Israel. The telos of the Torah is Jesus the Messiah. When you hear Psalm 40, you should hear the original author singing it. 
You should hear the people of Israel singing it. You should hear the Lord Jesus Christ singing it. And finally, because he sang it, we also get to sing it. Singer number four of this psalm is us. This is our song. As it was David's song, as it was Israel's song, as it was Jesus Christ's song, so is it our song. We can say, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Listen to the great promise of the new covenant that the prophet Jeremiah made. He said, when, when, when the, the true ideal Israelite comes, here's what's going to happen. Jeremiah chapter 31, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Here's the great promise that God makes to his people is that there's coming a day when instead of the law being outside of them, the law will be inside of them. When instead of commands coming from outside of them, they will have a desire to do the will of God from within. And when the Lord Jesus Christ at the Last Supper holds up a glass of wine and says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, he's saying, that day that Jeremiah prophesied is here now. I've come to put my law within you and to write it on your hearts. And that's exactly what happens on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit is poured out on the church. And that means, friends, that you and I sitting here today, where we are in history, looking back on the work of Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection, after the day of Pentecost, living in the age of the church and the Holy Spirit, that means you and I can sing with the psalmist, I delight to do your will, O God. Your law is within my heart, and that is true for us in a way it was never true in all of redemptive history. We stand at a moment after the resurrection of Christ and after the gift of the Holy Spirit where actually it is true that your law is within my heart. That's the cry of every true Christian, in fact. You know how you know that you're a real Christian? If your delight is to do the will of God. If you read Psalm 40 and you say, something in you says, yeah, that's what I want. I want to be that kind of a person. Whatever pleases God, whatever brings him joy, that's what makes me happy. And when I fall short of that, I want to turn to him and receive his grace and get up and chase after him again. That's what marks the life of one who belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ and has been brought into the new covenant. If the only thing motivating you to obey God is external compulsion, rules, commands, social expectations, family pressure, then you're still living under the old covenant. Christ has come to write his law within us, so to change us from the inside out so that we can sing Psalm 40 and actually mean it and sing it with joy and delight, knowing that verse 12 is still true. My iniquities have overtaken me and I cannot see there more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. How can it be true that you can delight to do the will of God and his laws within your heart and also your iniquities have overtaken you and they're more than the hairs of your head and your heart fails you? That's life in the new covenant. That's life in grace. In my deepest heart, I want to obey and follow God. And I know that I don't all the time, but I also know that God in his grace has made provision for me as a sinner who needs grace through the death of Christ. The greatest theologian of the 20th century, Karl Barth, asked this question. Who is the man who can take to himself the words of Psalm 40, verse 8? The psalmist was no doubt speaking of himself. But in so doing, he did not focus his gaze upon himself, but upon the future. 
the subject is obviously some future I that lives and works only by the grace of God. Who is the man who can take to himself the words of Psalm 40, verse 8? Friend, that man is you. That woman is you. Because of the grace of God that's been given to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the good news of the gospel, is that this has become our song. That because of God's grace to us in Jesus, we can sing this and really mean it. Would you join me in prayer? Our Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have come. In the scroll of the book, it is written of you. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. Only you can say that in the truest and fullest sense. And we thank you that you have come and you have delighted in the will of God. And that in your death and resurrection, you have made provision for our sin and our foolishness and our weakness. And that now, united with you by faith, we can say, I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. So Father, we say that as your people this morning. We we delight to do your will. We are a people who want to walk in your ways. So would you forgive us for where we have failed to do so? Would you meet us with your grace in the places where we find it difficult to do so? And for those within the sound of my voice who have not experienced the renewing grace of the law being written in their hearts and on their hearts, would you let today be the day when they come to you in faith and trust and experience that inner change where your commands go from something that stands outside of us to something that is inside of us with a heart to delight in you and in your commands. And we pray this for our good and for your glory. Amen.